Katsir. Um, before, I'm um, Sephardic Heritage International DC, or Shin DC. And um, we're very happy that you're, you're here with us today for our annual Purim and Noru's um, program, which we do to celebrate Persian diversity and its expression. And um, we have a very special program for you today. Um, we have Laurel Victoria Gray, the founder of the Silk Road Dance Company. Um, and so a number of you have seen the wonderful um, shows, performances that they, that they do in this area, including they just recently did a wedding from Bukhara, um, which included some, um, some Jewish dances. And, um, you, know, it's, you know, we're very happy to have Laurel um, with us today. She said she's the founder of the Silk Road Dance Company, teaches dance at George Washington University, and um, her scholarly articles have appeared in, in many publications. Um, and we're also um, going to have, um, we have downstairs the half scene table, which has you know, the, the symbols, the New Year symbols for Noru's, um, and some Persian sweets, and um, cocktails, sour cherry cocktails all ready for you. And, um, and we're also very happy uh, um, to be able to exhibit the photography of one of our co-sponsors, um, Alfred Yakub Zadeh, um, who, is in, who lives in France. And he, so we've curated um, some photographs from his collection, um, The Jews of Iran. And um, we also have some, uh, we also have in the exhibit photographs from the Sevrubian and Hertzfeld collection at the Smithsonian, um, at the Smithsonian, uh, which also has, um, you know, also has, goes with the theme, the Jews of Iran. And so we're, you know, we're thrilled to share that with you. And um, I would also just like to acknowledge um, our, our, co our co sponsors, um, our you know, partners with Shin, with Shin DC. Um, today, or we have, we'd like to thank the National Museum of American Jewish Military History. Um, otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be in this lovely space. And um, also like to thank the AFTAB committee. And um, you know, we have Sharuz, um, you know, in the back, say hello. Um, and um, so we're very thankful um, to the AFTAB committee um, for, for co-sponsoring this um, and working together, working with us on this. They're dedicated to empowering Iranian American artists and arts. Um, and I would also um, just like to acknowledge, um, you know, it's like to thank all, all of the, all of the volunteers, and also, as I would like to acknowledge Mr. Assad um, Aslanov, who's here with us today from the Embassy of Azerbaijan, um, and uh, thank you um, for for joining us, um, and um, and thank you all for coming. Um, and um, for, you know, and we hope to see you at more Shin DC, you know, Sephardic Heritage International um, events. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to, um, to, to call up our, the, the star of the evening. Um, I, I didn't mean that pun, you know, Esther Ishtar, our star of the evening, um, Laurel Victoria Gray, um, who, um, and the, the title of this talk is Sacred Seven, Tracing the cultural connections between Persian Noru's, which is the New Year, and Jewish Forum. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you all for coming. And by coincidence, my Swedish grandmother's name was Esther. So it's, there's a lot of resonance there. Something about the number seven is captivating. Think about it in natural phenomenon. Seven colors of the rainbow. Uh, seven notes in the Western scale until you reach the octave. The Pleiades, the seven sisters, the seven stars. Then also, metaphysically, you have seven chakras, or spiritually, you have seven virtues, seven sins. We can think of you know, the uh, old way of looking at the medieval world in the uh, in Hafpekar 
in that era of uh, Nizami Ganjavi, where there were seven climbs and seven planets. The seven Hoff Pekar, the seven beauties or seven portraits, seven resonates all the way through that. And you're going, how could there be seven planets? There's more planets than that, of course. But then you counted the sun and the moon, and then you had also uh, Saturn and Jupiter and Mercury and Venus and somebody I left out, Mars. How could I leave out Mars? So that's how people saw the world, the planets, and they also saw the climbs in different parts of the world. So seven certainly, um, it pops up everywhere. And when you get into um, the Judeo-Christian heritage, this seven is everywhere. But before we get into the specifics of the connections between Nowruz and Purim, I have to do a full disclosure. I'm not Persian, and I'm not Jewish. So how did I come to want to understand this? I am the great daughter, great granddaughter of a Mormon polygamist, which is why, according to Ancestry.com, I have over 400 cousins in Utah. Um, yes. <laughs> so I am familiar with patriarchy and polygamy and all those sorts of things. And when I uh, grew up as a Mormon, one thing the church encourages you to explore other religions. The idea is that you could, you would find that, that Mormon was so Mormonism was so true that no matter what you studied, you come back to it. But in my case, that didn't happen. <laughs> so the more I studied about other traditions, I was very curious about them. But um, I ended up leaving the church at 16. And then when I went on to my undergraduate work at Occidental College, which is where um, President Obama went for his first two years of college, uh, I found myself hanging out with the Jewish kids who told me that they were from the famous Los Angeles ghetto known as Beverly Hills. So I joined Hillel. I got involved with the Israeli folk dance. When one of my friends got married, I was the one leading all the, the dances at the Beverly Hills Hotel at her reception. So I, and I even considered at one time to um, convert, and my friend took me to see Rabbi Ben Zayah Bergman, and he said to me, so you don't have problems enough. You want to be Jewish, you know, <laughs> um, and which is the proper thing to do. You're supposed to discourage someone. So I realized that my interest is, is really was cultural, and I wanted to understand all these ancient cultures. In my family, apparently, we love um, ancient cultures and dead languages. The deader, the better, you know. So all these these things were appealing, and maybe also in part those old Bible epic movies that they would show. And you'd be sick and stay home from school and you'd see all these these films. They had such great clothes and wonderful buildings. and um, It captured my imagination. So back in 2001, I wanted to do a production for the Kennedy Center for the Millennium Stage because that's a was a new thing back then. And I came up with the concept of remembering the legends, 3,000 years of women as, you know, heroes and warriors and heal healers. And one of the characters that I wanted to portray was Esther, which was great because she was, she had two traditions that she could represent. She could re represent uh, Persian, which is the Persian dance that I have explored uh, as an adult, and also the Jewish tradition. As I started to think about it more, everybody knew the story of, of Esther, but when you really look into it and go like, I know with Purim, it's very happy and everyone's celebrating, but you know, there's a moment. No one knew how it was going to turn out. Esther was, what, probably 12? I mean, today, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the age of marriage in Iran for girls is nine. So, um, you know, so she would have been very young. Um, I would say probably just on the, you know, either had on the brink of puberty or had passed that. So think of a 12, 13-year-old girl with this kind of responsibility on her shoulders. And, you know, she's told, don't, don't reveal your identity, don't reveal your identity. And then finally, Uncle Mordecai says, no, you, gotta, you need to 
go to the king. And we all know that, that at that time, if you appeared before the king unbidden and he was in a foul mood, you would be killed. So it's not just like, get out of my sight. It was, it, it was death. And also think about the women who are with her. We, under, we know that um, there, she was assigned seven handmaidens. There's seven again. Uh, seven handmaidens, and they were to um, take care of all her needs. If something happened to her, then they would all have perhaps have some kind of shared guilt because she she did this act, this defiant act. And also, at the very least, they would have been sent out to other places, other households. Um, it seems that they loved her greatly and they had har harmony together. So it was a risk for everyone. Remember also that she fasted for three days and three nights, including no water. Now, the most that I've ever fasted, um, Mormons fast, but not, <laughs> not major fasting. But um, I did a fast once for five days, but I drank water. And it was miserable. So I cannot imagine three days and three nights with no water. And not only Esther, but all of her handmaidens as well. So in my imagining of this scene, it's very um, poignant. It's very uh, uncertain because she's, she could be going to her death. So we, I, I picked a costume for her. She's all in white. And they dress her. And each of the handmaidens I decided to put in a different color for the colors of the rainbow. Uh, one of the traditions I read said that, that she actually named her handmaidens, each one for a different day of the week, so she would always know when the Sabbath was. Uh, you know, these wonderful sort of uh, stories that have come down. Uh, so each one is a different color, and they are putting her in her royal robes. So we figured out a way to engineer this where each one would come to her and drape her with their color from, from the veil that they had on their head. They would put on her. At the end, she had all, all seven colors of the rainbow. And they, they put the crown on her. They put jewelry on her. Um, it's sort of a reverse of the descent of Inanna, which I'm going to get into a little bit later. So instead of having been disrobed, she is robed. And at the last moment, when they all, when she's fully dressed and she goes to her fate, they all kneel and they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know if they're ever going to see her again. So what, that to me is the, the main story of Purim. When you risk and you don't know what the outcome is going to be when you show that kind of courage. What a wonderful story for young girls to find a hero in, in Esther. So that's how I came to, to that story. But at the same time, I had been uh, m much involved with the Iranian community starting in my days in, in Seattle, fascinated by the dance, um, studying that, and all the other cultures are all connected. Uh, also, living in Uzbekistan, going to Uzbekistan many times, and working with famous dancers there. And one of the lineages of dance, professional dance in, in um, Uzbekistan, is through the Akilov family. The Akilovs are Bukharan Jews. So my teacher, Kislachondos Mohanedova, is uh, ethnic Uzbek, but her teacher was Isakar Akilov. And he was a carrier of this tradition, which, as you know, in the Islamic world is not unusual at all. The professional uh, entertainers, the professional dancers are often like Armenian Christians or Jews because they're doing the same dances, but they, um, they can appear in public where a, a respectable Muslim girl or a woman wouldn't. So they're... That is a, a lineage that I have, and through Kislehan and Issachar Kilov and his wife Margarita, I worked with her as well, her grandmother danced at the court of the Emir of Bukhara. So I have my own genetic DNA, but I have dance DNA too. So uh, we know that Bukhara, also a very important part of the Persian Empire, and according to the 
um, Shahnameh by Ferdowsi that it was founded by Persians. So there's connections going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Um, when we take a look at, uh, we'll get into to Esther. We'll, she's gonna we'll put her over to the side for a moment. When we look at the very obvious seven in in the Persian New Year, you know some of these things. Some of you are going to know very well because of your background, Persian or Jewish background, but sometimes it takes an outsider to stand back and go, wait a second, <laughs> what's going on here? So let's first remember the, the seven items that are part of that haft scene or the, the, the table that has the seven symbols on it. When I looked at it, I went, oh, this is an altar. I have never, ever had any Iranian person ever say that to me. But I see an altar. Because if you know other traditions of how people make offerings, it's all there. It's sort of like um, homemade magic. If you think about the things that are on there, they're all common house, household items or things that would be available that time of year or things that you would have in your pantry, which is true about a lot of these um, traditions. So we have, and they all, ha they all have different significance too. They're all things that you're wishing for. So why would that be important to wish for things? So we're going to go to the commonality of these cultures in the Middle East at that time, or in all humanity. We take it for granted that if we run out of food, we can go to the store and buy more. We don't worry about crops failing. This is actually pretty recent in human history. This is actually fairly recent. And there's still parts of the world that we know that people are starving. And a, a drought or a flood can, can ruin your crops. And you know we're facing the, the collapse of the, the bees. So who knows what is going to be in store for us? We're not, we're not paying attention. We're all looking down at our phones, and we're not looking up at what's around us. So when you're not certain, you're going to do everything you can to, to try to put luck or divine help on your side. Uh, we all have little things, you know, if we admit it, we all have little things that we do in our lives, you know, we, well, I, last time I parked over there, even though it was really busy for the Nowruz Festival, and if we go over to that side, I bet I can find a parking place. I mean, we, we're holding those little thoughts in our minds all the time. If we're honest with ourselves, we all have our own little rituals. So doing that formally um, is a way of invoking those spirits, and the idea is Life is rough. You don't know what's going to happen. There's illness, and there's natural disasters, and there's war. Uh, so what can you do to, to preserve yourself and your family? And this is a common response. So these populations that lived in this area all had to face this, the same things. Um, we certainly c can see this as a, co a common theme in some of the... Um, Bible stories, especially like Joseph, and he has the dream, and he talks to Pharaoh, and he, you know, like or Pharaoh has a dream, and he explains it, you know, the seven fat cows and the seven thin cows, you know, famine, seven again, seven's all over the place. So uh, the idea of wishing for things with the new year is really important. Also, why have the new year at the spring equinox? I, after I found out about Nowruz many, many years ago, I just stopped caring about American or Western New Year because how could it be New Year? Everything's still dead. You know, like there. But it makes more sense when things start growing, um, when, when things get fluffy. I always know that Nowruz is coming when you start to see fluffiness in nature. The trees are getting fluffy and the little baby animals are getting fluffy. And it's just this idea, this bursting forth of life. So that is um, that, that beneficent quality of nature is to be celebrated. And you think, okay, 
we're okay. We're, we made it through winter. We're going to be all right. So you could see that we got to we got to make sure what's our insurance company our uh, insurance for this. So let's try to find things that we can do. And even in cultures that have gone to a different religious tradition, they'll still go back to that. In Russia, for example, they had what they called dvoyevere, two faiths. So they had they accepted Russian Orthodoxy, but and they would have the priest come and bless the fields for the first plowing. But just in case, they'd go back to their pagan roots and they'd have a virgin on a white horse be led across the fields, you know, like backup. <laughs> so if the one thing doesn't work, we'll go back to the other way. So I think some of these might be um, echoes of earlier traditions. So for Norus, there's this beautiful table that's prepared. And, and the women take a lot of pride in making it as beautiful as possible. As beauty is, is core to Persian culture. I think that they have to have beauty or their, their hearts would break. So um, you have the apple. Um, and the apple um, all uh, represents beauty and health. So we always think about beauty being... Um, you eat an apple a day, and it's red. And I know some of my teachers in Uzbekistan said, like, you know, you should always eat red food. For some reason, it's really good for you. So, uh, seep. Everything starts with an S. That's the apple. Vinegar, serke, which is, interestingly, age and patience, which I'm really happy that it's on there because... When you think of, of spring, you always think of new life and birth and youth, but to, to know that, that age and patience is also part of our life experience and to honor that, that's important too. And it's with the age and patience comes wisdom. If you don't have wisdom, then you're going to get into a lot of trouble as a civilization. You have um, the wheat germ uh, pudding called samanu, um, and the Uzbeks prepare it. It's called sumalak. They stay up all night with this cauldron, the women stirring the cauldron and singing and dancing, which I participated that in, in uh, Uzbekistan. And that is also the wealth and health and abundance. And a practical concern, too. People are probably vitamin deficient after, uh, after winter. You haven't had greens and things to have, and so this is a way of fortifying yourself nutritionally. Um, sabze, which is just means green, but it's the sprouts that you'll see um, on the table downstairs. So the, everything's sprouting and growing. It it used to be that um, under the Persians in earlier times, they had seven grains that they would sprout. So again, seven, but now usually just one. But the idea that this is a long tradition. These things evolve and change over time. Um, but these are sort of the, the contemporary things that are done. Okay, so we have um, uh, side, which represents love, and it's a kind of a dried olive. So we might you know, might have to go to a Persian specialty store to get it now. But um, but again, these are things that people would have at home. Um, and we have sumak, which you probably know is that wonderful Persian spice, and it's it's sort of a orangey reddy color. And it represents sunrise. It represents light, the triumph of light over dark, which is going to be an important theme. And then sir, which is garlic, and that represents good health. And it's also, where's wood for me to knock on? It's why I haven't fallen prey to the horrible flu that's been going around. You know, so just saying. People, maybe it's just because when you eat a lot of garlic, people don't want to get too close to you and so you don't get their germs. I don't know. But, but there's so much wisdom in some of, uh, some of these things. There are other things that also will go on on a hafsin table. Um, you'll have coins, um, seka, which would represents wealth and prosperity. Um, the hyacinth also, um, Sanba, so this just is one of the plants that come up. There are hyacinths coming up in my garden now. Um, we'll have also the lilac, Susan. We'll have that can be another, that idea that, you know, nature has forgiven us <laughs> once again. 
and um, is coming back. And you always wonder, like, how does it how does it know? But it does. So, interestingly, um, the some of these items were also connected with um, angels, with the um, holy uh, angels of ancient Persia. And they were guardians of different aspects of people's life, guardians of wealth, or there'll be water on the table too, or there'll be a fish in, in a fishbowl. So guardians of water, you know, all throughout the East, they have sayings about water is life. And it's, it's very true as we're finding the, in South Africa today where, you know, they're having no water. I think it's, it's um, in April where they're, one of the cities will not have water, enough water for people. So it's, it's frightening. And water may be the new, the new gold. Um, so those are the, the characteristics on that table. Um, and, and all of these, there'll be, there's sometimes candles, um, or a lamp, there's painted eggs, if you wonder where Easter eggs came from. Um, there's all these, all these things. So these different angels were guardians um, of these elements. So the idea that it's not just your items that you're putting out, but that you're invoking some other kind of presence to protect you. Um, and they're called the seven holy immortals. So there were six angels but the seventh was Ahura Mazda, and that completed it as seven angels. So uh, that is very ancient, and we're going to find another connection with seven in these cultures as well. So as I mentioned in the Esther story, Esther had the seven handmaidens, and if you remember at the very beginning, um, that the feast that was happening with her, with Vashti's husband, which we identify in the West as, uh, through the Greek name Xerxes. So they were feasting for seven days. All right, so there's another seven that was there. And what do they do? They, he calls on his seven um, chamberlains to go get his wife Vashti and to be dressed beautifully and appear before all these men who've been fighting for his and his generals and things, um, and to show her beauty. All right, so ladies, can I say, can you imagine like Super Bowl Sunday only for seven days? And at the end of the seven days, you know, after a lot of drinking and feasting, your husband wants you to dress up and come down and appear before his friends. I, I sympathize with Vashti completely. <laughs> so, um, and, and what does that mean too? Well, like her, her rebellion well, what, what happens with the rebellion? Do you remember that part of the story? So they're, call, he, they're called seven um, sages, seven advisors called in to judge her. What, is it, what are we going to do about Vashti? Because other women might get the same idea of uh, defying their husbands. And it was a, a, a human, humili humiliation because here he is a ruler and he can't rule over his own wife. She defied him. So she is put aside, and we don't know exactly what happens to her. There's different ideas about what happens to her, but we know that she has to be replaced. So just keep in mind, before you get too personal, <laughs> that um, as Joseph Campbell would always say with these stories, it's all allegory, all right? It's all an allegory, so there's something else going on. These stories are wonderful ways for us to remember things, and there's certainly... Uh, certain kind of uh, morals that can be taught through them, but there's also many, many levels that can be approached. So um, let's take a look at some of the characters in, in the stories, and let's look at the, um, the allegorical resonance here. So in, in both cases, um, with no ruse, it is a victory. It's a victory over darkness and winter. And if you go back farther, it's really a struggle between Ahriman, who is the devil, and the forces of, of light. So it could be Ahura Mazda 
or um, Jamshid, it's just different characters, but that struggle all the time between light and dark. The idea in Zoroastrianism <clears throat> is that um, everything that is good and light and beautiful comes from the divine positive source, and everything that's e evil and wicked, that is the dark force, and that's Ahriman. Now, you know, I am not a, a scholar of ancient Persian, but Ahriman and Haman kind of sound similar to me. <laughs> so, is, and even if there's no linguistic connection, they have the same role, because um, Haman is, is the the villain of the the Esther story, and he is what Shakespeare would say hoist on his own petard, because the gallows that he builds for Mordecai end up being the gallows from which he himself is hung. So, what? Who are these people? You know, um, if we think of the, that struggle between dark and light and, and winter and spring um, that is universal and especially in, in places where there's not a lot of plenty. Who are these people? So if we say Haman is Ahriman, the idea of that the, the evil, dark, destructive force. Um, so who is Mordecai? And he has been often linked to Marduk, who is a very powerful Babylonian god, very, very powerful. And Marduk is Mars, so he is not only uh, the god of, of war, but he's also linked to the planet Mars. Esther is Ishtar, Astarte, Inanna, all those goddesses, and she's linked to the planet Venus. So <clears throat> uh, Ishtar is the goddess of sexual love and war seems a contradiction. Sex and war, they're like opposite, but actually they're not, because uh, one makes life and the other takes life. Very powerful and, and worshipped for a long time, and there's all, you know, even in um, up in the Caucasus, like there's the goddess Nana was known. There's all these sorts of legends that are still going, Nana, Inanna. They're, they resonate, but, you know, often when you go to a museum and you look at the little figurines, when they... Uh, are describing the figurines of a female, they'll go, oh, it's some kind of fetish, it's some sort of odd female figure, and they don't acknowledge the, that it is an image of a goddess. But, you know, we're getting over that now, but, you know, the whole that whole uh, attitude, as well as um, the story of Vashti, is sort of a hashtag me too from ancient days. So we have to um, maybe look at things a little bit differently. Now, when we, we know that once Esther wins the beauty contest to be um, brought into the household of, of the king, she goes through this period of seven months where, sorry, six months, where uh, she is uh, anointed with the oil of myrrh, and then six months of perfume and cosmetics. It's like a you know, royal spa that she's at. Now, Six months, really? And she's so young, like, what could you do to perfect a, a, basically almost a child? But I think that it might be the description of an astronomical event. You know, they often talk about the house, like in, when the moon is in the seventh house, you know, the, the different houses. So if Esther is Venus, and Marduk is Mars, and Xerxes would be Jupiter, right? The ruler, the powerful. And there's something going on with the planets. What could that be? I don't have one of those wonderful programs where you could go back and look at like 500 BC, approximately, see what was going on. But somebody could and see what was happening. And actually, there is one um, person who believes that there is something like that happening, but it, he didn't connect it to the story of Esther. He connected it to another ancient story. But the idea is that with the, with the story of Esther, as we'll also see at the other story we're going to visit, that um, it, remember Esther uh, fasts. She doesn't eat or drink, and none of her handmaidens eat or drink for three days. 
before she appears. So the idea was that it's some kind of um, arrangement of the planets where Venus has disappeared for three, year, three days before she reappears as like the morning star, which is a fairly regular sort of thing. But somehow the connection with the planet Mars and Jupiter all coinciding at the same time, um, and there might have been something in the Bronze Age that, that connected that. Um, and, and then it's the House of Aries. Anyway, um, we get all into the, the astronomy of it. But I just think, you know, sometimes these stories are allegories for natural phenomenon with all kinds of other things on top of it because I think the characters seem very real to us because we all understand about jealousy and about... Uh, difficulties between husband and wife and uh, all, all those sorts of very, very human qualities that are there as well. So Ishtar was the queen of the heaven, and we're going to look at her story now. This is an older story, probably, well, how do we know exactly how old? But it's a very old story of this thing, and that is about Ishtar the descent of Ishtar or Inanna. And it goes back to Gilgamesh, if you know the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is considered to be humans' oldest piece of literature, um, maybe four or 5,000 years old. And to, to my astonishment, a friend of mine who is Azuri said, oh, Gilgamesh, yeah, we know about him. And we, I went, what? You, like... It, that he had read or they could recite it. Um, we, we, there's even um, an account of um, someone whose father was a reciter of that particular story of Gilgamesh who could recite it in, in the, um, I think, late 1800s. Um, and that was, so it was still alive as an oral tradition. You know, we used to use our memories a lot more. We used to all be able to mem memorize phone numbers, right? You know, like now, can you remember your own number, maybe a best friend, but we don't use our memories. But when you go to cultures that have this tradition of, of memorizing things, it's astounding. And that there are whole epics. There's many traditions of epics where people have committed it to memory. And the story of Gilgamesh seems to be one of those. It later was written in cuneiform. So that's how we have it um, in a couple of different uh, variations. This, her descent. So the, the little backstory with, with Gilgamesh is he's, he's um, you know, he's really good looking and powerful and everybody's after him. Um, and so Ishtar decides that she wants to um, make him one of her lovers, but she has a very bad reputation of teaching, treating her lovers poorly. So he spurns her and um, being the goddess of sex and war, she gets really mad. <laughs> So she has the bull of heaven attack him, and he, he kills the bull of heaven. And it turns out the bull of heaven is the husband of her sister, Eresh Kigil. And her sister is in the underworld mourning the death of her husband. And Ishtar, Inanna, Astarte, decides to go see her. And she dresses beautifully like Esther, she has like a crown, she has um, special jewelry on, and she has a measuring rod that's made out of lapis lazuli. Now, why would that be important? Why would, you know, like me carrying around a measuring tape? Well, I need it because I always measuring out costumes and, and fabric and things like that. But, you know, we always say that, that humans are the creatures that um, are, we're distinct from animals because we create tools. Well, we know now that animals also create tools because we've seen examples of it. But maybe it's what makes humans interesting is that we like to measure things. We notice patterns in things. That's why we like seven. That's why I like to use seven in my choreography. There's something very satisfying about that shape. So certainly measuring things, you see all these images of, of Persian kings and um, Mesopotamian that they have this measuring um, device that is part of their kingship. It's part of their kingship. So she pounds on the gates of the underworld and she gets in. And what, what happens is that at each gate, there's seven gates. 
she has to give up something. And each time something is taken from her, like maybe first it's her crown, she says, what, what is this? And they say, I wanted to say it, do not question the ways of the underworld, for they are just. She goes to the second gate, and they take the beads she's wearing. What is this? Do not question the ways of the underworld, for they are just. And it goes on till finally at the seventh gate, they remove her dress. So she's completely without any jewelry or ornamentation and no clothing. So she's completely naked and defenseless in front of her sister. And she is judged by seven judges. It's like the same, this, those seven, they're everywhere. Um, and she's condemned to death. So they take her, they give her, they look at her with anger and they give her the death stare and she dies and they hang her corpse up. So, but she had an insurance policy. <laughs> she said, if I don't come back to her supporters, if I don't come back within three days, you got to go, you got to come get me. You know, you have to, you have to intercede for me. So she's hung up. To, you know, for three days, again, like Esther, three days out of sight. And they finally are persuaded to give her the, the water, the food and water of life. So it restores her. But there's a deal that has to happen because there has to be a sacrifice. And it's in all these legends, throughout all these cultures, there always has to be a sacrifice. Think about it. Every single ritual that we have as humans, it seems like there always has to be a sacrifice. So they have to have somebody take her place. If she leaves the underworld, who's going to take her place? And they go to all of her, her beloved supporters, and they all are mourning for her. Well, they can't take them. And then they go to Tammuz, who's her lover, and he is not really upset at all. He's a uh, you know, drinking wine and hanging out with dancing girls so that she gets, when she finds out about this, she's furious and she sends him to replace her in the underworld. But then another story that his sister says, no, no, please spare him. And what they do is they trade out six months of the year. It's just like the Persephone story, right? If you know that story. So, so six months of the year, Tammuz is in the underworld and six, six months of the year, the sister is in the underworld. So they trade off. The one thing about um, Ishtar also when she gets angry, because she is all about fertility too, is that there is no fertility in the land. So there's no human fertility, the crops are not growing, the animals are not breeding, and it's, it's really the worst curse that you could think of because, again, you're just, you can't go to, you can't go to Whole Foods and, you know, get, get food. There's nothing happening. If you're not having new animals being born or new, new crops or new um, food, then you're really in trouble. So uh, this, I think this story might be the, an underlying story that resonates in both of these cultures. And it all goes back to the struggle between light and dark, the struggle between winter and, and, and the death and spring and life, all that goes, resonates for us and repeats over and over and over. So, <clears throat> what can we learn from these stories that are so inspiring for us that we, you know, for how many generations you know, have people celebrated Purim? For how many generations have people celebrated Nowruz? And why does it make it feel happy? Make us feel happy? Like just yesterday was the Nowruz festival at Tyson's Corner. So many people there, and they were all so happy. People were greeting each other, hugging each other. That that sense of joy of being with friends and family, and maybe. People only maybe see each other once a year because we all have our lives that take us in different directions, even though we live in the same area. So what is it? It, 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 it reassures us. Ritual reassures us um, that even when faced with, with darkness and death and destruction, that, that 
the light will win. You know, we'll defeat Haman, we'll defeat Ahriman. And I wanted to just, first of all, um, think about the modern uh, lesson we're being taught by the young people, maybe Esther's age or a little bit older, who are now protesting things, going into the street, whether you agree with them or not, that's a brave act for them to do. They can't even vote yet. You know, if they be here, appear before the king, what will happen to them? Already, you know, they've, they've had their own names and, and uh, uh, reputations and their own uh, motivations questioned, so they've been humiliated in public. But it's very brave of them, like Esther, to go forth and, and stand for something. Um, so then let's take a look also at this, this figure of, of Ahriman and um, what, what is said about him. Because I think that he, he's a personification of evil. In fact, you even might, might call it it. But what does that mean and what can we see in it? It said that, um, that the demon of the lie is the mother of all darkness and evil. And only can this be uh, defeated by wisdom and knowledge. And the idea is that humans are in this constant struggle um, with divine forces against the forces of darkness and evil. So we're all constantly involved in that. And why is it that Ahriman is like that? Um, why does he get awakened? Why is he in the universe even? Why can't we just have everything good and nice and happy and, you know, loving and all that sort of thing? So here's um, from this wonderful book about No Ruse with a lot of uh, uh, research that had gone into this about their ancient roots of uh, different traditions of Persian Persian holidays and especially with No Ruse. And I'll, I'll have it up here later if you have questions. But, but it said that... Um, you know, in, in Ferdowsi's story of Zahak, which is in the Shahnameh, which is the story, is, is, to, to boil it down to something very um, simple, is that a king is, gets tricked by Ahriman, who's he's a very crafty guy. He's a very crafty guy. And, and, you know, as we know, evil can be very seductive. And he is tricked by Ahriman taking the form of a cook, a really good cook, making delicious food. And Zahag is just like, oh, I've never had anything so good. And he just adores all this food. And finally he says, you know, to the chef, whatever you want, just tell me, whatever you want. You're like the best ever. I'm just loving everything you fix. What do you want? And the cook says, well, you know, that's a big honor. All I want, if you would, don't mind, if I just kiss you on each shoulder, you know how the, in some cultures you're kissing and hugging people. It's a very uh, sweet way to greet people. Um, it just kiss, just kiss your shoulders. So Ahriman does, and what happens is from each shoulder a black snake comes out of the shoulders. So you have these snakes writhing, and and uh, Zahak is terrified. You know, snakes. <laughs> So he tries to cut them off. They grow back. And Ahriman takes now the other guys as a, as a doctor and says, well, clear to me, you've got a bad case of snakes. So, And you know what? You can't get rid of them. The only way that you can keep them from harming you is that you have to feed them the brains of two young people every day. So it's sort of like Persians invented zombies, you know, <laughs> brains. Okay, so the idea that his, the youth, the youth, you're going to sacrifice the youth and the brain, the thought that, you know, that they're going to devour their brains. This evil force is going to devour the brains of the youth. It's a very powerful story. So um, what do we know of, of that story? Well, his sto that story, Ferdowsi's story of Zahak suggests that it, an ignorant sinner occupies the highest office in government, and Zahak was the king, all-powerful. He could require that two youth be sent every day to be sacrificed, and this went on for 
in the story for hundreds of years, hundreds of years. If an ignorant sinner occupies the highest office in government, the result may be that he will kill as many people as he feels necessary to bring him peace of mind. Indeed, at times, a generation of human beings can be sacrificed for the ignorance or evil deeds of their leader. And just in the 20th century, we can think, you know, we can think about the, the Cultural Revolution in China. We can think, of course, about Hitler. And if you want to make other parallels, you're free to do that as well. But this is all, you know, it, we do it over and over again. We all have to keep fighting this, this fight against the forces of, of darkness and evil to bring spring to ourselves and our friends and our family, to our countries and to our, our um, descendants. So this number seven, if you start looking for it, you're going to see it everywhere. But it, again, it's something in nature, it's something in metaphysics, it's something in um, spiritual traditions. And, you know, it's also uh, in fractals, there you see seven. I mean, all the seven is just everywhere. There's something about it, and maybe we just don't have the science to explain why it's important to us, but humans like to measure things. Humans like to see uh, repeated patterns, and it's certainly there. And the idea of, of both Purim and Nowruz is that we can defeat the forces of darkness and rejoice in the light. So let's go forth tomorrow for the Nowruz. You see it already today. And rejoice in that and really put down our phones and enjoy this miracle of, of nature and that, you know, it's happening again. It's happening again. Spring is coming and it's like a renewed vow. But we have to remember it's a struggle. You can't be complacent. It's only if everybody works to to bring more wisdom and tolerance into the world that we will defeat the forces of darkness. Thank you.